Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A very good morning. Distinguished speakers and participants, ladies and gentlemen, let me begin by thanking our host, the Joint Committee on Climate Change, Banagara Malaysia and Securities Commission, and the co-organizers for inviting me to deliver today's keynote. Having attended the past two days of the conference, I must say that this is the most comprehensive conference on climate change that I have participated in, and I personally have learned a lot. The emphasis for this third day will mainly be on the corporates. Please allow me to share my perspectives, not only as the chairman of Busan Malaysia, but also as a trustee of WWF Malaysia. In the 15 minutes given to me, I will cover these in, three, in four parts. First, on the big picture, the climate change and global commitment towards net zero. Secondly, on key developments in the capital market and the case for sustainability. Third, our role at Busan Malaysia in advocating sustainability. And fourth, the way forward, pathways to net zero. Ladies and gentlemen, COVID-19 and climate change may appear to be different, but they have many similarities. Both crises are causing substantial disruptions to the global economy, undermining the resilience and well-being of society especially in terms of loss of lives and livelihood. COVID-19 has caused some 3.9 million lives to date, and as many as 150 million people are being pushed into extreme poverty by 2021, according to the World Bank. Climate change, if not addressed appropriately, will similarly be catastrophic. According to a stress test by the Swiss Re Institute, the world economy could shrink by 18% in the next 30 years, if no mitigation action is taken against climate change. Like COVID-19, climate change knows no borders and presents an existential challenge to us all. The adverse effects of climate change can undermine past development gains, threaten the prospects for achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and increase the risk of our ecosystems collapsing. A failure to achieve the SDGs will negatively affect billions of people worldwide with substantial damage to livelihoods, exacerbating poverty and the spread of diseases. For nearly three decades, the UN has been bringing countries together to attend the Global Climate Change Summit called Conference of the Parties or COP. Since then, climate change has evolved from being a fringe issue to becoming a global priority. In November this year, the United Kingdom, in partnership with Italy, will host COP26 in Glasgow. The conference aims to bring together more than 190 world leaders, thousands of negotiators, government representatives, businesses, and citizens to accelerate action towards the goals of the Paris Agreement and the, and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or UNFCCC. This involves, among others, the need to secure global net zero by 2050, half net emissions by 2030, and keep global warming within one and a half degrees centigrade. On the last count, some 127 countries responsible for 38% of global greenhouse gas emissions have pledged to be carbon neutral by 2050. This includes the UK that has set the most ambitious climate change target into law to reduce emissions by 78% by 2035 compared to the 1990 levels, building on the earlier target of 68% reduction by 2030. Malaysia similarly is expected to ramp up its climate ambitions, in addition to the current pledge to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 45% by 2030, uh, including in the future setting a clear net zero target. It is worth noting that 75% of Malaysia's greenhouse gas emissions are driven by the energy and transport sectors, contributing 251 million tons of carbon out of the total 334 million tons of carbon based on 2016 data. To achieve the global target of net zero by 2050, countries need to commit to, among others, accelerate the phase out of coal and encourage investment in renewable energy, optimize energy demand and speed up the switch to electric vehicles, and curtail further deforestation. Failure to accelerate our action will result in temperatures to keep rising, 
catastrophic flooding as what we have experienced in all countries, including here in Malaysia, more frequent forests or bushfires, extreme weather, and destruction of species. Now, speaking of destruction of species, WWF reported in 2020 that wildlife populations globally have fallen by 68% over a period of less than 50 years since 1970. This catastrophic decline includes the extinction of Sumatran rhinoceros right here in Malaysia. The last female rhino by the name of Iman sadly died in November 2019, despite efforts to save her. Unless drastic actions are taken, our Malaysian national icon, the Malayan tiger, may be facing the same fate as the rhinos. As we speak, the number of Malayan tigers has dwindled to less than 200 compared to 500 a decade ago. Let's all do all we can and make this a national priority to save the Malayan tiger suffering and avoid it from suffering from the same fate as the rhinos. Now back to climate change, to speed up the transition to net zero will require significant funding from both public and private finances. And this will involve developed countries honoring their promise to mobilize at least 100 billion US dollars in climate finance per year and trillions more in private finance to secure global net zero by 2050. This will naturally create demand for sustainable finance moving forward. Ladies and gentlemen, awareness and efforts to address climate change are gaining momentum in Malaysia with a host of ongoing initiatives led by the various uh, government ministries, uh, including the Ministry of Environment and Water, uh, Ministry of Finance, and um, uh, what we call KETSA. Uh, we have Bandagara and the SE2. Efforts are being made to develop a climate change legal framework that will support the implementation of the Mission Climate Change Commitments under the UNFCCC. In addition, the Mission Government has put in place many different incentives to ensure Mission is on track to meet its commitment under the Paris Agreement and accelerate the transition towards a more resilient and inclusive economy. And we have heard that uh, from Dr. Sri Zaini and Dr. Nagula Rendran uh, from the uh, from uh, CASA uh, over the past two days. We have also seen the development of the climate change and principles-based taxonomy uh, by Benegara Malaysia, as well as the Securities Commission's SRI roadmap, which aims to, to create a facilitative SRI ecosystem in the Malaysian capital market, which integrates SRI and Islamic capital market. We've heard from both uh, the governor of Benegara Malaysia and the SE chairman to this effect. Now, over the years, investors and fund managers have increasingly realized the value proposition of incorporating ESG considerations in asset allocation and recognize the potential in the increasing client demand for values-based investing. Based on a recent Russia Bank GSIA analysis, assets with ESG mandate are expected to reach some $160 trillion in, or by 2036. This would mean close to 100% ESG integration into fund management. And likewise, this global movement towards sustainability is also being supported by financial institutions. Banks like HSBC, for example, have committed to be net zero by 2050. And this includes commitment not to fund coal projects by 2030. Many other banks have made similar commitments, including Maybank and CIMB. It is therefore important for corporates to embed sustainability in their business. Companies that choose to ignore sustainability or ESG consideration in their business will not be sustainable as they will be deprived of both equity and debt financing as well as human capital talent necessary to drive their business. Nor will they be able to sell their products as consumers become more discerning in buying only sustainable products in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, on our part here at Busan Malaysia, we continue to promote sustainability among our listed issuers. The FTSE for Good Busan Malaysia Index has played an essential role in recognizing public, public listed companies that have taken steps to improve their ESG practices and disclosures. Since its launch in 2014, the number of constituents in the index has tripled from 24 to 76. 
As part of our continuous efforts to promote and encourage the adoption of ESG practices, the whole methodology and ESG scores of PLCs are now available on our website. For a company to be included in the FTSE 4 Group Bursa Malaysia Index, its ESG scores will be assessed according to the FTSE 4 Group Rating Model. PLCs that score a minimum of 2.9 out of 5 and can demonstrate that they are applying measures to manage their material ESG risk will be included in the index. Since the launch of FTSE for Good Busan Machine Index, the exchange has been engaging with our stakeholders to determine the need to incorporate more SRI elements in the ESG index that can better suit our local investment landscape. We are also expanding collaborative efforts to work with financial institutions to offer sustainable financing products to PLCs that have shown interest and commitment in improving their ESG practices. Next month, Bursa Malaysia will be launching the FTSE for Good Bursa Malaysia Sharia Index. This new index will comprise constituents of the FTSE for Good Bursa Malaysia Index that are Sharia compliant according to the SIS Sharia Advisory Council's screening methodology. Apart from ESG related indices, Bursa Malaysia has also played a pioneering role in compelling PLCs to adopt good ESG practices and disclosures. For instance, since the establishment of the sustainability reporting framework back in 2015, all Malaysian PLCs are now disclosing sustainability statements and reports annually, detailing the governance structure put in place, as well as the approach to managing their material sustainability matters, which covers an extensive range of economic, environmental, and social themes. In addition, the exchange also assists PLCs along their sustainability journey via the provision of comprehensive guidance and feedback, undertaking various advocacy and training in areas such as climate change and anti-corruption. Our listed issuers also benefit immensely from our Bursa System portal, a one-stop knowledge repository for corporate governance, sustainability, and responsible investment. Ladies and gentlemen, to tackle the issue of climate change holistically and comprehensively, beyond addressing the energy use and generation in our country, transition towards net zero requires innovations in technology, shifting consumer behaviors, and social economic transformations. In this regard, I would like to draw your attention to an ongoing joint study by WWF and BCG to explore key building blocks and potential transition pathways for Malaysia to achieve a net zero target. Based on our preliminary findings, under the current business as usual pathway, net carbon emission levels are expected to double from 75 million tons of carbon equivalent in 2016 to 159 million tons of carbon equivalent by 2050. A low carbon emission pathway will potentially reduce carbon emissions by some 60% by 2050, but to achieve net zero by 2050 will require significant additional efforts. For illustration, the most cost optimal way to reach net zero by 2050 will require 100% electric vehicle penetration, 57% renewables in energy mix, retention of 55% forest cover, and that means 18 million hectares, and in 2050, compared to 18.2 million hectares currently, and limited carbon capture, utilization, and storage, or CCUS requirement. This will require some 350 to 400 billion ringgit cumulative investments, mostly in energy sector, representing 0.8% of GDP per annum until 2050, which is comparatively lower than 1.8% of GDP for Indonesia, 2.1% for China, and 7.4% for India. In terms of benefits, climate transition could generate up to 40 billion ringgit in incremental GDP and 400,000 incremental jobs by 2050. Now, I must qualify that these are preliminary numbers and are subject to further studies expected to be completed sometime in September, October this year. Now, to complete this study will require significant input from all stakeholders. And in that respect, I would like to invite all nation corporates and all parties to come on board together with us 
to work together on a possible net zero pathway for Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, I must say that I have been inspired by the many speakers over the past two days, but more needs to be done if we are to transition to a genuinely sustainable and climate resilient economy. Market players, regulators, policymakers, and all stakeholders need to work together to develop and deliver a sustainable financial system that works at all levels. As they say, with any crisis or catastrophe comes the opportunity to reset our world, to build back better and greener, as in the words of Sir David Attenborough. With that, I thank you for your attention and have a productive day ahead. Thank you.